just as a reminder. So remember that the leadership we're talking about is a, is a way of sort of being in relationship with other people that in which you're able to sort out in certain situations what's yours, what's theirs, what's ours in terms of emotional stuff, even uh, responsibility kind of stuff. And in the sorting out process, one of the keys is that we do it while trying to stay in relationship with the other person. So, for example, just by way of example, when Coach Dale and Myra Fleener first met last week, in the last week's clip, they were, he was on the steps going on his way up. That wasn't a comfortable conversation, right? That was, that was a very uncomfortable conversation that they had. And I can easily imagine me or anyone else wanting to avoid Myra Fleener from that point on because it would be easier than to try to maintain a relationship. So with that in mind, what do you think about the next morning? There they are in the parking lot and there's Coach Dale saying hi to Myra Fleener. It's almost his way of saying, let's try this again. Mm -hmm. And he's taking responsibility for it. He must have decided that this is a relationship that's important. And so I'm going to assume responsibility. That's kind of sorting out what belongs to me. And what belongs to me is the relationship. It belongs to us, right? It belongs to us. Now, in that exchange, did you pick up on Myra Fleener's attitude towards him? Remember what they said? She said, remember she said, I, I hear the men weren't very charitable with you last night. And he said, oh, I keep forgetting there are only 50 people in this town. Yeah. And she says, this hick town. I didn't say that. Well, that's what you meant. Okay. There's the you language coming from Myra Fleener. You, and I presume to know what you think. Do you think that that's really what he meant? No. Or was it an attempt to inject humor into a tense situation? Isn't, that's kind of a way of disarming, isn't it? You, if, you can, if you can inject some humor, but it can blow up in your face as it did with him. What do you think? Was he being sarcastic with her about that? I didn't catch it, so I don't know. Yeah. You, you couldn't hear the, dial, the dialogue? Is that, is that what you mean? No, I didn't catch, I didn't catch that, that. Sarcasm? No, I didn't catch that phrase. I didn't, I didn't catch that dialogue. Oh, oh. Um, in the parking lot. Yeah. So in other words, you couldn't hear it or you weren't here yet. No, I was here, but oh. I didn't catch that part of it. Gotcha, gotcha. Anyone else have thoughts about whether it was sarcastic? No? I think it's more like self-deprecating humor almost, like he was, you know, being more in it. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that's, uh, it was an attempt perhaps to de-escalate a, a, a tense situation. It didn't necessarily work. But then the language, there's this pause, right? There's this period of time where they don't say anything and they're walking down the, in the parking lot and then she says, well, I assume you're gonna to wanna to talk about Jimmy. And, and he says, why, why would I? 
What does that immediately say about Coach Dale's frame of mind with regard to what belongs to whom? And now we're talking about Jimmy. He may not know who he belongs to yet, but he knows what? It's not him. Jimmy doesn't belong to him. But it seems that Jimmy belongs to her. Well, that is immediately the next thing that comes out of her mouth. Um, so she marks her territory. <laughs> All right? This is what belongs to me. And what belongs to me is Jimmy. Now let me piece, let me unpack this a little bit. Now keep in mind this is 1950, right? 19, in the 1950s, 51. Myra Fleener is a teacher. Jimmy is a student. Myra Fleener is not a member of the family. But she says, he and I decided now, which one is Jimmy? You haven't met him yet, but when they were on the basketball court practicing, there was that brief scene where somebody was off court and looking in, but he didn't say anything. That's Jimmy. That's Jimmy. He was playing, he was playing basketball by himself when they first started the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So what was my question again? Uh, so Jimmy and I are she, she says, and I look out for him, and so she's marking her territory. Uh, his, his father died a long time ago, or something, something's gone on with his family, and he has no parents, and she's looking out for him, and he and I decided. Oh, she decided. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm a parent. I know. Sometimes <laughs> Sometimes the decision can be left to the child, but she's taking this decision away from him, assuming it on herself from what I'm understanding. There's no reason she should be telling Jimmy what he... At least I think. So let's think back to what we know so far then. What is the town's attitude towards Jimmy, the townsman in the barbershop? They want him to play. They want him to play. What is Myra Fleener's attitude? She doesn't want, she doesn't want him to play. And where is Jimmy in all of that? He wants to play. Yeah, but where is he in terms of relationships? Uh, he's being tossed around. Um, yeah. He, he's, he's listening, listening to her. He, what? He's listening to her right now. I forget why is he playing. We don't know. We don't know. Other, th other, than, other than what Myra Fleener just told us, we still don't know. Yeah. Um, he's not playing. He's, right now, he's listening to her. Right. The only scenes that we've seen with him is by himself. I don't, I don't believe he is part of the community of this yet. I think he's very isolated. Hmm. But, but do you think he's aware of the competing expectations? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Most of people. Sure is it is he's he's proverbial he's the you know proverbial caught in the middle kind of guy. Sure. You gotta play. You gotta he may be he may be alone, but let's keep in mind he's a he's a minor, okay? He's a high school kid, and he's got adults telling him what he should and shouldn't do. Which set of adults does he listen to? I don't know. I'm wondering, and this is, an, I don't, this is sort of off the movie, I don't think the movie suggests this in any way, but is this abusive? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. It's abusive. We know that today, but yes. in 1951. Right, they would, never, they would never have thought of it like that. <clears throat> Which brings us to Coach Dale and George. George is the, George is the guy who said, well, I've been, uh, I've been coaching the team. Okay. You know, he was in the barbershop. Yes. The guy in the barbershop sits down, and he's the one that did most of the talking. 
And I could see that Coach Dale's kind of sizing him up in that barber shop, but he doesn't say anything. It was smart. It was very smart. But. I was sitting on the court. Yeah, that's what happened. This is going to dovetail into our fable today. But imagine that this is a church. And someone has taken authority over an area of ministry that doesn't necessarily belong to that person. But the person is very forceful, shall we say. Have you ever encountered anything like that in church life? <laughs> oh, of course not. Right. What is the typical, in your experience, what's the typical way that people deal with that kind of personality? Walk away. Walk away. Okay. Try. Were they what? Try. They try what? To walk away. The first time. Yeah. Some, yeah, sometimes if somebody's overbearing, you have to let. It, it, it's no point in wasting your energy trying to get them to change their mind. They're not, and somebody higher up in authority has to set them straight. So in a church situation, the parishioners can't do much about it, except you know if they've tried once, they go somewhere else because they don't have the authority to move this person either. And fundamentally, that's why there's no leadership in churches. Because you're absolutely dead wrong. Okay, you are. You're dead wrong. When there is a conflict like this between George and the coach, where this George guy has no business whatsoever being in the position that he's in, what tends to happen, in my experience, is people make excuses for George. Well, George is just being George. Well, you know, we, we try, we're Christian here. We've got to try to get along with each other. And these kinds of personalities can take over. I will change the names to protect the innocent. It has nothing to do with Christ Church. Okay? This has nothing to do whatsoever with Christ Church. But uh, I know of a family in another congregation who ended up leaving, moving to a completely different state because of someone like George in their congregation. And no one had the wherewithal to say to, jo to the George person, you're out of line. You're out of line. But let me tell you a true story about me. When I went to St. Paul's in Munster, Indiana in 2000, 1999-2000, I was appointed by the bishop to be priest in charge, just like I was here. It's hard to remember that. You know, like, you think you've always been rector. Nope, I was priest in charge. And Ed Little, the bishop, specifically asked me to take my skills as an interim, as an intentional interim, and work with the congregation through the developmental tasks of inter interim ministry, which I won't go into. And then let's see after a year whether or not you, you know, they would want you to stay and you would want to stay, that there would be a mutual decision to stay and you could become rector. I'm like, okay. So, during the course of that year, uh, I learned an awful lot about a congregation that was very, very sick, emotionally and relationally, very, very sick. Uh, I had a guy yell and scream at me, uh, a parishioner yell and scream at me because we got a new sign out front that said St. Paul's and it didn't say Episcopal. And I mean, he, and I'm not exaggerating what I say. He yelled at me. He got red in the face and yelled at me. I just stood there and I'm like, well. It's a sign. <laughs> it's a sign. 
It's a sign. Who? That's a. <laughs> anyway, so other things were happening. Uh, other things had gone on. Uh, a couple had broken into the rector's office, the previous rector, and taken the computer, which apparently belonged to the church, but t took the computer and found emails on the computer. Not nothing, nothing, you know, like terrible other than emails that this rector sent to colleagues where he bemoaned the, some of the relationships and things that were going on at St. Paul's, which these people took as offensive and used it as evidence that this rector needs to leave. And they had a way of dealing with congregational, with conflict, the congregation had a way of dealing with it that I later uh, fondly called congregational gladiator, where the whole congregation would turn up for a vestry meeting and there would be, a, they'd duke it out. And the result would usually be that the, the priest would leave. <laughs> so anyway, uh, while I'm so I'm now I'm priest in charge, and one of the things that I do, or as an interim, is to look at the staff and make sure that letters of agreement are all in line for the next potential rector. Uh, I need to to explain to them the way the Episcopal Church works. That when a rector comes on board, that rector has the canonical authority to choose his own staff, and it's, it would be wise to be ready for that, blah, 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 blah. The organist, the, the part-time organist, I could not find a letter of agreement. I asked him if there was one. He said there was. I said, could you give me a copy? And he never did. So several months went by, and I said, well, um, how about this? I'm going to assume that you really don't have one. How about we make one together? I went to the American Guild of Organists website, I put together a, uh, a uh, letter of agreement. I did add something. What I added were some expectations for professional conduct. There had been a history with him in the choir in which conflict, he would deal with his own issues with the choir. So what I tried to do was create a situation where he would pick or choose two, anyone he wanted, people in the congregation who would function as his advocate if there was a conflict. And then two members of the vestry would be part of this, what essentially a personnel committee, if they ever needed to meet then they, they would, and the idea behind it was to provide a way in which the organist at least feels that the, he's got people in his or her corner. Uh, and quite honestly, I thought it was a stroke of genius on my part, uh, because it, it, it kept him there, okay? I didn't make a big issue out of all the stuff that had gone in the past, but I, I made it clear that I, I was very, very concerned that he wouldn't last long. If, if that kind of stuff continued, and we had to figure out a way for him to deal with disagreement. So anyway, the contract, uh, we went over it together, he took it home, and then one week went by, two, three, four, five, six weeks, eight weeks went by, nine weeks went by, nothing. I kept asking him, uh, come on, we need, to, we need to finish this, we need to you know, tie this thing up. Nope. I gave him a deadline. I finally said, look, all right, I'm giving you this deadline. And if you don't, I'm going to assume that means you're resigning. And the deadline came and went. So uh, he was gone. He's done. Dun -da -da -da, congregational gladiator uh, uh, was the result. The couple that had broken into the previous rector's office uh, actually came to the office, was, I, I could, I, I'm in my office, I can hear them talking to my secretary, demanding my computer, and I can hear her saying, but it belongs to him. 
Oh. And I'm thinking to myself, your dog on right, it belongs to me. And one thing led to another. And then, it, as it turns out, on the day that the vestry was going to meet with the bishop to discuss whether or not I would be rector, that was the day when Congregational Gladiator happened. I knew it was happening. I, could, I knew it was coming. And I told Ed about it. And Ed said, why don't we take the whole rector bit off the table for now? I said, that's a good idea. That's a really good idea. But he still came. All right? So there I am in this. We, they had a banquet hall, huge banquet hall with chandeliers. It was like, it's very opulent. The bishop is sitting next to me here, and then the vestry is sort of around, like a corner of in a, in a U shape, and out there are the congregation, and there's a microphone. And the organist goes up to the microphone and lays into me, and I listen very quietly. I didn't say a word. When he was done, I asked him if, if there was anything else. He said, nope. And I said, well, oh, thank you. And then the wife of this couple went to the microphone. And the, this stuff came out. Of course, it came out with the organist also. He was doing a lot of you, as in you, Ben Jones. But, the, and I'm not going to remember the specifics. This is quite a long time ago. But she, she was basically saying things like, what right do I have? Who do you think you are? And da 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 and she went on for some while, and when she was done, I asked her if there was anything else, and she said no. And I said, well, I need to tell you that I'm not going to answer any of your questions. Because the congregation is not a personnel committee. And I will not talk about personnel issues as a congregation. You answer to us, she says. And I said, no, I don't. I answer to God, the bishop, and my wife. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and I could tell immediately the wind had been taken out of those sails. And then the bishop was able to explain to the congregation Episcopal polity and the way things actually work. There was no way I was going to try to reason with these people, but nor was I going to attack them. But I basically said, priest in charge, that belongs to me, not to you. I don't care whether you think it does. I don't. Because it doesn't. It belongs to me. I know how I, my duties and responsibilities as the priest in charge, and I live by those, and you have that much to say about it. And I know that any attempt to try to reason wouldn't work. Any attempt to try to assuage or uh, make them feel better, or oh, well, this, you know, we'll figure out a way to do this in the future so that this won't happen. No. The, these people needed to come face to face with a boundary. Six months later, they moved to Michigan. There's a couple that. They moved to Michigan. They were my George. They wanted it their way. Right, they were my George. That was their church. They were going to. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can hear the language. It's my church. Da, 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 da. And, you know, most of the time people say that, and I'm like, you're right, it is your church. I'm, you know, I'm not here forever. But I'm sorry, the, my priesthood belongs to me, not to you. Amen. Okay, that's the thing. So what I'm trying to say is that the hardest thing, this is where the rubber meets the road for uh, you know, Christians in parish life, is sorting out what belongs to whom and saying so when necessary. This is my responsibility. That's your responsibility. To not let 
uh, the Georges, in essence, hijack and take hostage an entire congregation. I've met some four-year-old Georges, too. <laughs> oh. All right, well, I've only got ten minutes. Uh, let me just say one more time that if, uh, remember that there's a 909 Prime Zone Facebook page, and uh, I'm putting these fables up on it, and I can see from my end who's seen it, and I notice that no one has seen it. I actually did. I okay. It's on your phone. Okay. Um, all right, so here we go. Let's see how much time we have. Once upon a time, in a friendly forest, there lived a lamb who loved to graze and frolic about. One day a tiger came to the forest and said to the animals, I would like to live among you. They were delighted, for unlike, the, unlike some of the other forests, they had no tiger in their woods. The lamb, however, had some apprehensions, which, being a lamb, she sheepishly expressed to her friends. But, said they, do not worry, we will talk to the tiger and explain that one of the conditions of living in the forest is that you must let the other lamb animals live in the forest. So the lamb went about her life as usual, but it was not long before the tiger began to growl and make threatening gestures and menacing notions. <clears throat> Each time, the frightened lamb went to her friends and said, it's very uncomfortable for me here in the forest, but her friends reassured her, do not worry, that's just the way tigers behave. Every day as she went about her life, the lamb tried to remember this advice, hoping the tiger would find someone else to growl at and it is probably correct to say that the tiger did not really spend all or even most of its time stalking the lamb. Still, the lamb found it increasingly difficult to remove the tiger from her thoughts. Sometimes she would just catch it out of the corner of her eye, but that seemed enough to disconcert her for the day, even if the cat were asleep. Soon the lamb found that she was actually looking for the tiger. Sometimes days and weeks went by between its intrusive actions, yet somehow the tiger had always succeeded in being there. Eventually, the tiger's existence became a part of the lamb's existence. When she tried to explain this to her friends, however, they pointed out that no harm had really befallen her and that perhaps she was just being too sensitive. So the lamb again tried to put the tiger out of her mind. Why, she said to herself, should I let my relationship with just one member of the forest ruin my relationships with all the others? But every now and then, usually when she was least prepared, the tiger would give her another start. Finally, the lamb could not take it anymore. She decided that as much as she loved the forest and her friends more than she ever loved any other forest or friends, the cost was too great. So she went to the other animals in the woods and said goodbye. Her friends would not hear of it. This is silly, they said. Nothing has happened. You're still in one piece. You must remember that a tiger is a tiger, they repeated. Surely this is the nicest forest in the world. We really like you very much. We would be very sad if you left. Though it must be admitted that several of the animals were wondering what the lamb might be doing to contribute to the tiger's aggressiveness. Then said two of the animals in the friendly forest, surely this whole thing can be worked out. We're all reasonable here. Stay calm. There's probably just some misunderstanding that can be easily resolved if we all sit down and communicate. The lamb, however, had several misgivings about such a meeting. First of all, if her friends had explained away the tiger's behavior by saying it was simply the tiger's nature to behave that way, why did they now think that as a result of communication, the tiger would be able to change that nature? Second, thought the lamb, such meetings, well-intentioned as they might be, usually try to resolve problems through compromise. Now, while the tiger might agree to growl less, and indeed might succeed in reducing some of its aggressive behavior, what would she, the lamb, be expected to give up in return? Be more accepting of the tiger growling? There was something wrong, thought the lamb, with the notion that an agreement is equal if the invasive creature agrees to be less invasive and the invaded one agrees to tolerate some invasiveness. She tried to explain this to her friends, but being reasonable animals, they assured her that the important thing was to keep communicating. Perhaps the tiger didn't understand the way of a lamb. Don't be so sheepish, they said. Speak up strongly when it says the, does these things. Though one of the less subtle animals in the forest, more uncouth in expression 
and, un, and unconcerned about just who remained, was overheard to remark, I've never heard of anything so ridiculous. If you want a lamb and tiger to live in the same forest, you don't try to make them communicate, you cage the bloody tiger. And that's why I love Ed Friedman. <laughs> so why, why do the animals excuse the tiger's nature, yet try to make the lamb ad adapt? It's easier. It's easier. The path of least resistance. Well, if they went out and tried to confront the tiger, they might eat them. Well, and that's, here's the question. If the tiger eats the lamb, whose fault will it be? The tiger's. Is it? Think, think a little deeper. Think of the relationships. It's not just the tiger and the lamb, right? So the, uh, the enablers, the, the other animals in the forests? I'm asking... Whose fault would it be if the tiger, in essence, did what tigers do and eat the lamb? All of them. All of them. Or any of them. Or what? Or any of them. Or any of them. I mean, the lamb could have gone. The lamb could leave? Yeah. The lamb could have left as soon as the tiger showed up, you know? So that would be a solution? That, well... Not a, not one that the lamb originally wanted, not one that the friends wanted, but the state of fact that the tiger and the lamb came from the same forest. I'm kind of surprised that the lamb, tiger didn't already eat the lamb. <laughs> well, it's a fable, so. The rule was you had to get along. That's the rule. You know, that's like saying canon law says. <laughs> in, in, in times of conflict, you can throw canon law right out the window. No one, get, no one cares. Well, I like the last line. If you want the lamb and the tiger to live in the same forest, you don't try to make them communicate. You cage the lamb. And whose job is it to cage the tiger? <laughs> isn't, isn't it the other members of the forest? The entire forest is responsible for what the tiger does because they won't stand up. They say, here's the rule. But then when the tiger breaks the rule, well, the tiger's just being a tiger. You may be actually doing things to provoke the tiger. But I'm, I'm eating my grass. Okay. <laughs> There's at least one. <laughs> Anything specific you want to share? <laughs> There's at least one analogy to the Episcopal Church. Well, I don't know about the entire denomination, but it, it's, this, is a, this is a very apt description of the kind of stuff that goes along in the most unhealthy of congregations. No matter the, de the denomination, this is not anything unique. And, and so here's a question. When dealing with uncompromising forces, are peace and progress ever compatible? And remember, the question says, when dealing with uncompromising forces, are peace and progress ever compatible? Uncompromising peace is always going to be going on with that. Right. Because no, even though the tiger didn't necessarily, you know, go near the lamb after a while, just the very thought of the tiger being there was, all, was still oppressive. The tiger was nowhere around for weeks, yet she was still thinking about the tiger every 24 hours a day. So, so it, it, I'm curious if any of you had a negative reaction to the way Dale says, Let's be really friendly here. My name is Norm, and your coaching days are over. I mean, did, did any of you think there might have been a better way for him to handle that? No? no? I, that's kind of hard to 
we felt rushed. Yeah, and why not? Why did you not see that? Why did you say that? Because the other guy was not, he was not standing down like he should have because... He was the uncompromising yes, force. And we, and yeah. The job, the job was given to someone else. If, if, um, if he was given the job because he'd been coaching, um, that would have been one thing, you know, but he was not given the job. Right. He was given to somebody else. So, obviously, <clears throat> he wasn't good enough to get the job. Be that as it may, you know, the, whatever reason there is why he's not the coach, the fact is, he just isn't. But from the very first second they met, what did George do? Try to claim the territory, right? I, I've been coaching. I'm the coach. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be coaching you. And so here's the, like the sort of exception to the rule, as I've been saying, that leadership is about sorting out what belongs to who and remaining in relationship. And sometimes that is not possible. It just isn't. Not unless something miraculous happens that no one can predict and no one can wait for, for it to happen. Or just like, let's pray for a miracle. Maybe he'll change his spots. Yeah, well, maybe Jesus will come again. Okay, kind of thing. Which is what, but see, that's what people will do. Well, you know, let's pray about it. Let's, you know, maybe he'll... He'll, he'll change his ways. In the meantime, nothing ever gets done with the team. The team doesn't get coached. The team doesn't learn how to play. Okay. They all want to be individual stars. And they're, you might have one that shines a little brighter than the rest of the team, but he's only as good as the team surrounding him. So the last question I'll leave you with, and then we've got to quit. To what extent is evil or any disease an independent force, and to what extent are its destructive effects the result of an immune, immunological failure? Let's put it another way. Imagine that the tiger is a virus, and the forest is a body, and the members of the forest are the blood cells, the T cells, the antibodies. Is the tiger, is what's happening in the forest a result of the tiger being evil? Or is it the result of the rest of the body failing to do its job? The rest of the body. The rest of the body. And that, of course, is exactly what happens with cancer. Cancer is what it is because for whatever reason, the body has no longer recognizing it as a, as a foreign thing that needs to be attacked. And it, it like rolls out the red carpet. Come on home! Okay? And, and cancer just does, it, does its thing. And at an emotional level, in terms of emotional systems, groups of people, whether it's business, nonprofit, a church, a basketball team, whatever, all of these things are at work. And the healthy congregations, and I, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to tell you right now, Christ Church is one of them. The thing that makes healthy congregations healthy is not because they've got the greatest rector or whatever. It's because the body of Christ is functioning like the body of Christ. And there is ample situations in the New Testament where Paul is saying to the body, you have to stand up to this, right? This is not acceptable. Anyone who preaches a different gospel than me, out. Don't compromise. Stand your ground. Stand firm. All kinds of stuff in the New Testament uh, saying to the body, be the body. All right. Got to stop. See you next week. Thank you.